This is the third sermon in the series that I've been doing on how a liberal religious congregation responds <clears throat> to social issues. And I looked at the list of things that people said were important social issues, and this one is the one that talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, how do we deal with diversity? There's a lot of diversity, and how do we, how does a congregation respond to diversity? So the way I want to do this, I want to tell a story first, then I want to talk a little bit about sort of the big context of why diversity is an issue today, and then I want to talk about some practical ideas. So in 2010, I, I had to go to a conference in India, and uh, I showed up uh, about a day before most people did, so I had an extra day. And uh, a, a woman from uh, Chile, Isabel was her name, got there at the same time. So the two of us had an extra day on our hands. Oh, what to do? And uh, we had looked out of the place we were staying, and we could see there was a big temple down the street. So we thought, well, let's go down to the big temple. Uh, we don't know. Neither one of us had been there, didn't know much about it. So we decided, well, we'll go down to the big temple. So we walked down and uh, walked in the gate, and there was a kind of a guardhouse, kind of a, it was either a welcome center or a guardhouse. And uh, so <laughs> I thought, I'll be, you know, polite. So I kind of go in and try to be apologetic. You know, I'm here, I don't know the rules, just checking in. Well, we're glad to have you. The only real rule is you, you have to take off your shoes before you go up the steps. That's star, par for the course. And then the guy said, and by the way, the, the high priestess of the temple is, is available. She'd probably see you right now if you want to go see her. Well, so I said, well, gee, that sounds, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> um, so he uh, took us over and ushered us into this big hall is as big as this bookstore, big marble floors, and of course there were no chairs, just big open hall, and over in the corner was this uh, middle-aged woman, all dressed in white, sitting on the floor, because there were no chairs for anybody, and she offered us to you know, sit down, so that means sit on the floor, so we all sat, the three of us sat, were sitting there, we had, we had a great conversation, she was very fluent in English, and we, we talked about the spiritual, uh, we told her we were doing social change. We did social change, and we had a good conversation about the spiritual, what, why you have to be a spiritual person to be involved in social change. I noticed while I was sitting there that uh, she had a, a little, there was a little thing next to her that it looked like, um, it looked like a very fancy mop for a child's dollhouse. Uh, it was it was about it was a little handle about this long and it had little tassely things and it it was it was white uh, and uh, she was all dressed in white and I realized well, I know what this is and she's a Jane this was a Jane temple and the Janes uh, they don't kill anything and uh, this was a, a a device for swatting away bugs. So, and uh, if a, like a fly comes, she would go, and it wouldn't hurt the little fly, and uh, the, it would go away. Uh, <clears throat> to this day, every time I swat a mosquito, I think of her and her little. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other, at the end, uh, I, we had a good conversation, and she told, told us to go visit the temple. And when we came back, she said, when you come back, I'll give you a prayer to say at your meditations. And she gave me that prayer that I read this morning. Um, and then when we got done, I said, well, let's, let's stay in touch. And I, I reached in my pocket and pulled out my calling card. And uh, she said, just lay it on the floor. And uh, so I laid my calling card on the floor, and then she picked it up. Now, my friend Isabel who said, here, here's my calling card. She held out her calling card, and the woman took it just like that. I found out later, this woman had taken a vow of celibacy, and part of her vow was that she would never touch a man. And there was a chance, in the process of me giving her a, my calling card, that we would touch. And she wasn't going to risk that. So she asked me to put the calling card on the floor, and then she picked it up. I have, I have since encountered other... 
uh, uh, I, the woman at the um, Islamic Center, who's the principal of the school, uh, she's a Muslim woman. She won't touch a man that she's not married to. So when you go in there, you can say hello or whatever, but you, you don't shake her hand. It, it, it will not happen. Those two things taught me, uh, th that example of encountering uh, the woman, the, the high priestess, taught me, have been a kind of metaphor for me of, of encountering radical diversity. That woman is, is a lot, she has a lot of different habits than I do, but, uh, but when she and I talk about being a religious person doing social change, she and I understand each other 100%. Uh, now, some of the poetry she puts on it and some of the things she does are not exactly how I handle my response to that mode of being, but it's important. So diversity in our world, more and more of us are encountering situations that are not exactly the same as the situations we come from. The human, this is a gross, gross generalization, but I'll make it and try to live with it. Uh, the human society over its history of evol evolving over time, we've lived in three big kind of hunks of ways. We, we've lived as tribes, we've lived in urban environments, and we now find ourselves in an eco-futuric global community. Now, in the tribal situation, you could basically assume that everybody was like you. I mean, most of them, like in a village. I lived up in Wyden, West Virginia. Wyden, West Virginia is a tribal kind of situation. <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, if somebody shows up in Wyden and you don't know who they are, you, you know for a fact you don't know who they are. <laughs> and don't try to say, oh, well, I, no. No, if, if, the head, if the head lady and her husband introduce you around town, then you're in forever. You can go back whenever you want. But if you're a stranger, don't tell me that you just accidentally showed up there. No, you didn't accidentally show up and widen. Um, so tribal, there's a mindset of tribal sameness. And, and if you're not the same as everybody else, you probably should leave. And there's probably some place you can go, but just go. Now, in, a, in, a, in the urban situation, the urban environment, one way to look at the urban situation that got us through the last two or three hundred years is that powerful people set up industrial economic systems that needed workers to come into, and you can come into the city if you obey the rules. But if you're not obeying the rules, there's prisons and guillotines. And, <laughs> and, uh, you, and the city depends on people obeying the rules. Now, in the last hundred, couple hundred years, we've tried to democratize the cities, and that's working moderately, but let's just be clear, there are powerful influences that run urban complexes. Uh, I don't want to give that lecture, but... Uh, now... I, I, but you and I live in a different kind of world than either of those. We live in Facebook, and we live in Twitter, and we live in FaceTime, and we have, many of us here have been in diverse situations, and we live in a different kind of universe than either of those other two. So when you encounter diversity, you and I have to develop a new set of skills. In Wyden, when you encounter diversity, you have one set of skills to deal with it. But that set of skills does not really work in our society. And, but the new set of skills for dealing with diversity aren't completely understood. And that's what I want to work on in the last half of the sermon. Now, the, the second, there's a second big change that we have to deal with. I'm not sure how it's related to the first two, but it's different. And that has to do with how do we understand the way the universe itself works. For thousands of years, we have been, we have built up the story 
that we live in a fixed universe that was created by some powerful gods, and this is the way it is. And you should try to fit into it. There's, there was a time, there's also a, been a, a, a story that we kind of live in a cyclical thing that kind of goes around and around, and if you wait long enough, it'll come back around. That's a, that's a different story. And then we're now coming to, the, to understand that we live in an emerging reality. It's 14 billion years old that the humans emerge. Come on in. Come on in. Everybody's welcome. You get the front row. Um, we live in an emerging reality that is continually unfolding and that, in fact, we are participating in the unfolding -ness. Now, this also uh, changes the way we relate to diversity because in a fixed reality... You were made your way, he was made his way, and, oh goodness, I don't know what you were made in, so <laughs> you're, you're, you don't fit my stereotypes, go home. Um, but what we begin to understand when you look at the vast unfoldingness of the universe is that the way the universe works is it creates different kinds of things. And each of those different kinds of differentnesses fill uh, a niche and and they have different uh, capacities in that niche that's going to be next year's sermon series but uh, suffice it to say we have a new framework for looking at diversity you and I look at diversity from a global perspective in an emerging reality and that is different from the way that previous generations and people who have mindsets that are different than ours look at diversity. So what I want to try to deal with now is how can you and I equip ourselves to more effectively handle diversity and then help other people handle diversity? That, that's a difficult that's where I think the difficulty is, is that it's not that, be, that so one, so now I'm going to do some practical things we can do. One, go to strange places. Two, <laughs> allow yourself to live uncomfortably and then get self-conscious about it. Uh, three, discern unique contributions of things that are different than you. And I want to say, and the fourth one is sort of the backside. Uh, the answer to diversity that love everybody all the time, that answer either shortchanges love or um, uh, or, or, or doesn't really mean everybody. Uh, and what I want to say is this, it's not the case that you have to say yes to everything that everybody does all the time. If, if, if love everybody always means agree with everybody all the time, and th then that's not what I mean by that. And I'll give an example in a minute. So go to straight, go, going to the Jane Temple was quite an amazing thing. Uh, it was completely, it's a completely different way of handling the relationship to the profound mysteries of life. Uh, the, the high priestess, she did a lot of stuff different than the way I do a lot of stuff. The temple is monstrous. Uh, and uh, uh, Rita's been there. It, it is, uh, it's different than the back of a Scubber Dog bookstore. Uh, and so, let yourself go there. Go to strange places. And let yourself say, wow, okay, this is different. And try to understand. Try to let it flow in. And then, the more you do that, the easier it becomes. Let yourself live in uncomfortable situations. Uh, I got uh, invited uh, by an African-American friend of mine 
to uh, be a teaching assistant of his at a seminar that he did at Morehouse College in Atlanta. That's, uh, that's where Martin Luther King graduated. They, some people call it the Harvard of the East, of the, the Black Harvard. So Elaine and I went. Elaine went because she knows how to lead uh, reflective conversations, and I went because I know how to draw with a compass and a straight edge. And uh, the, <laughs> the two of us went, and we were the only two white people in a room full of people. And I, I have, I have uh, seven years of education after high school, and I was far and away nowhere near the smartest person in that room. I, I know that, and uh, I learned real quick, just shut up. Uh, and, uh, and people were telling jokes about things that I had no idea what was funny about that joke. <laughs> uh, and they were talking about people like they, they knew, and I didn't know who that was. And uh, it was, it was it, I was self-consciously out of place in, the, in that room. Uh, and there was no point in me saying, hey, wait, 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 what's, what's so funny about just live with the fact that I didn't know quite what was going on. And I, I didn't. And I feel the same when I go to the, to the school in Chicoli. And there's 700 people speaking Marathi. And uh, most of the time, I don't have a clue what's going on. Uh, I, I, everybody looks friendly. And uh, they seem happy. And uh, they're talking about something. Uh, and uh, I've learned, though, to listen because... Sometimes they'll say, and now Nelson Stover, and that means you better be standing up. Um, and the, the third, therefore, we need to, in that kind of, those kind of situations that I've learned to try to, when I run into somebody that's different than me, I've learned to try to figure out, well now, what's this, what's this person's contribution? And, I saw, like the, the Jane, uh, the Jane uh, priestess. Well, what is her contribution? Well, I mean, she has taken seriously this don't kill anything. And, and every now and again, I, okay, I'll go get, catch the grasshopper and take the grasshopper outside. And, and I, maybe she went too far, but I go too far on some things too. Uh, and, and some things I say real strong, just take them with a little grain of salt. And so how do we learn to try to discern the, the, what's this person's real gift? And what's this person's real gift? And then some of that is, is helpful to me, and others I should just appreciate it as a gift that somebody else has, and it's not my gift. And then I, I want to get said, this, I want to come back to this point about not everything that everybody does is helpful. And sometimes you have to find a way to say to a person, look a person in the eye and say, your actions are now not helpful. Uh, on on uh, September 11th, 2001, at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, Elaine and I were on an airplane at Piedmont Triad International Airport, getting, getting ready to fly to India. Uh, we did that plane never took off the ground, uh, and that was that was a, a really incredible day. Uh, I'm not going into all the details, but uh, needless to say, we didn't go to India that week, and we stayed home. And uh, the whole world was there was an awe over the world on 9/11. And a couple of days later, I had taken two weeks vacation, so everybody was counting on me being gone. But there was no point in not going to work. So a couple of days later, I went back to work. And uh, one of the guys in our office sent around an email joke about a Muslim. It basically said all Muslims are terrorists, was the point of the email. And I, walk, I got up out of my desk. I walked back to that guy's desk. I said, Mike, that kind of, it, it, that's a, unhelpful. And you better never do that again that I have any way of knowing about, or I'm going to make a lot of noise. Uh, 
You just have to, sometimes you just have to go to somebody and say, stop! You're not being helpful. Uh, I never got, <laughs> there were no more emails like that circulated around our office anyway. Uh, at least they, at least I wasn't on the distribution list. <laughs> um, and that was fine with me. So, but putting yourself in these kinds of positions, walking into strange places where you do not have a clue what's going on, being willing to live with that uh, uncertainty, uh, and being able to, to look somebody in the eye and say, I don't know what is uniquely gifted of you, but I will find that out. Those require a kind of interior resourcefulness that people like you and I need to work to develop because the world badly needs those kind of people who can walk out of the comfort zone of their tribal village who can walk beyond the existing power structures and can still function with some kind of reliable capacity and competence. Who can build those kind of bridges? So practically, what does that look like? A couple of weeks ago, I was at a big banquety kind of thing in a hotel, and you know, there's lots of people and all the tables and the waitress. They all served plate dinners and all this. And <clears throat> one of the wait, one of the wait staff women had a habib on. You know, she said, "I'm the Muslim." So I, I, I noticed that she was like all the other people, coffee and stuff. But when she, when she came to my, when she came to my table. I made a point of looking right at her and saying, ma'am, you're a gracious, you're a gracious hostess. I, I don't know what to, I don't know what to do and say in a situation like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, but, but you got, I wanted to say something that said, you're affirmed. Um, that's a hard, it's hard to know what to do. Um, I make it a point, I make it a point when I, uh, when I go to like the fun fourth or something and the policeman's out there standing, what's, you know, uh, what are they? Then there's nothing going to happen. But I always make it a point of trying to say to the policeman, thanks for being here, sir. Ma'am, thanks for being here. Um, I mean, the police get a bum rap. A lot of bum rap. There is a lot wrong with policemen, too, the police force too. I, they've made mistakes. But let's not deal with that. Say affirm, affirm the policeman. Uh, affirm the woman in the Habib. Somehow. We, we've got to find little ways. It's little things. Now, there's also big legislative proposals that we need to make and all that stuff. I'm not again. I'm all for that too. But you and I, let's find ways to look each other in the eye and say, you're affirmed. And, and do that every day. Whether you know the person or not. Uh, try out, try out living in alternate, different ways. Uh, I, I, when I go to India, uh, I, you're, I, being a vegetarian in India is a whole lot easier than being a vegetarian here, let me put it that way. But, uh, but uh, learn to, learn to, to appreciate the other, the way different people eat. Sometimes, some of it's really good, others so good. Um, uh, or and and my friend the high priestess. Uh, I still swap mosquitoes, and stink bugs do not have a place in my house. <laughs> but I will try to help the grasshopper who jumped on the window. I will try to help the grasshopper get out the front door. So she's had an effect on me, you know. Um, and and then we we need to try to find ways to to help the world 
understand to affirm diversity. Like, it's not just exactly enough to go to my friend and who makes cynical comments about Muslims and just shout him down. On, on, on one hand, you just got to say stop. But then I need to try to find ways to help journey the rest of the world into an awareness of diversity. And, and if laws are important, but that's not the whole answer. I, I think of uh, uh, the Triad Health Project and their Dining for Friends. Now that's an amazing strategy that they developed a, a number of years ago. Have, have find a straight couple and some gay people who know each other and have them host a party together and then invite their friends. So, so, I'll, uh, so I, I have some gay friends, but I know some people who don't think they know any gay people. They think they're <laughs> three-headed monsters. <laughs> so let's have a party. I'll invite my friends, and they'll come because I said come. And then... Oh, and by the way, this is my gay friend. Oh, really? Uh, and uh, I don't know. Um, just out of, anybody here? How many people here have ever visited the Islamic Center of Greensboro? It's worth doing. It's worth going to the Islamic Center of Greensboro. They have open houses a lot of Saturdays, and uh, and go there. It's it's a. <laughs> It is a different kind of place. Uh, uh, so you and I can find ways to begin to open up the doors for others to walk into a world that is increasingly diverse. And that diversity is what the universe is counting on. I mean... Susan over there is a wonderful woman, but we can't have a whole world just like her. I mean, all you get is charts like that. Um, and uh, there's times when you need that kind of a chart. But she will never play the piano. Like that. I know that. Maybe she will. Will you, Ben? Play it? No. No. She uh, play Okay, so... Well, I'll never play the piano like that, that's for sure. Um, so the universe thrives on difference. The universe is really happy about diversity. There's no, there's no evidence in my looking anywhere in the universe to see that the universe is trying to get everything to be the same. It ain't. And, and the way the universe grows is it creates an open space and then it kind of waits to see who's coming in the middle. And, and, and it's always a surprise. Who shows up in the open space? Wow. Uh, so let's, let's help the universe build diversity. And that's, that's the gift of people like you and I because creating that open space is not a trivial task. And, and allowing something to get started that's new and fresh is not a trivial task. And it requires the kind of skills that you and I in this congregation have. And that's the kind of world that I hope we can work together to create. Thank you.